Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning into our video. I'm here with my colleague, my friend Eric Morris, Dr. Eric Morris, and he just came up with this book called A Brief Guide to Building Your Therapy Practice. And I found it quite useful. There's a lot of really good tips, very technical tips, pragmatic, some philosophical, and I think a lot of people can benefit from it. So I just invited him to have a dialogue with me, an interview, and see his journey in writing this book, what is it that he, um, the main points from the book, so people can have an idea, so they can go and, and read the, the book by themselves, and also the way he sees therapy, the importance of therapy, that type of thing. So thank you so much. For My pleasure. Eric. Thanks so much. And, and also, by the way, he's also writing another book. Yeah. We'll be talking about mm -hmm. it a bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, so tell me, what is it that inspired you to, to write such um, a book? Well, I mean, as therapists, we don't really have any sort of training in this area at all. I mean, you have all of your classes in terms of how to do particular therapeutic approaches, um, but in terms of the business side of therapy, there really is hardly anything. Uh, so most therapists kind of emerge from their graduate training clueless. And so, you know, every person has kind of, kind of redesigned the wheel. And I thought uh, that was frustrating. And so I know, you know, when I emerged from my degree, uh, I had no idea what I was doing in terms of how to get new clients, how much do I charge, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do I differentiate myself from anybody. Uh, so it was this um, iterative process where I, I kept track of what I was doing and I just kind of kept throwing ideas out and just cr trying new things. And so I was accruing this like long list of things that I was trying to do. Um, and then slowly that started to become successful. Um, and then I realized, okay, you know, once I had achieved a certain level of success that I, you know, maybe I can try to put this into some sort of format that people can benefit from and don't feel like I just kind of not wasted my time, but I feel like I just wanted someone to benefit from, you know, everything I had learned. Uh, cause I still talk to therapists all the time who, you know, don't have websites, don't have business cards. They don't have kind of what I can consider the basic elements of running a practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's this mistaken belief that, you know, once you get your degree, you know, kind of once you put your shingle out or once you kind of let yourself, you know, let the world be known that you, you exist, that the business will start to roll in. And uh, that is, I think, absolutely not the case. Uh, so that's, I think, why I wrote it. Is that kind of the myth that just open the place and people will come? Yeah, I think there is that belief. Uh, it's either like a naivete kind of thing in terms of, you know, people will find you somehow. Um, or overconfidence or, or just confused and you know unsure how to proceed. I think that's probably a lot of it. It's just uh, intimidation about how to build a website or how do I start, you know, all these different things. So maybe there's a certain, you know, put my head in the sand and won't think too hard about it or, you know, or they try to do some research online and become quickly overwhelmed. Uh, so there are a lot of sections in the book in terms of even you know, basic things like, you know, what do I need in my website? And again, like I said, you know, what do I charge and how do I differentiate myself? And, because uh, you know, in Montreal there's thousands of therapists. How you know, mm -hmm. how does a client pick you, and why should they? So you know, even having a simple elevator pitch for when you talk to your colleagues, you know, just to differentiate yourself and to kind of create a memory in their mind, you know, so that when they're ready to refer, they're thinking about you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's um, yeah, I just I, I think there's not enough business training at all in in in, in graduate programs, mm -hmm. and I think it uh, they, they do us a disservice because of that. Mm. So it seems that you really you you, you finish uh, your studies, mm -hmm. and then you were trying a lot of things. Yeah. And then there's something a lot of things that worked. Yeah. And then you realize, well, this just worked for me. Mm -hmm. So why not share them? Why not share yeah. them? Why not make a book? Yeah. So it's a win-win. Yeah. I win by making a book. People yeah. win by doing it. That's it. That's a it's a great service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really glad you did it, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It uh, it worked really well. So I guess the majority of people who go through your um, through your journey, they get successful, they may share with a couple yeah. of people and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah just we, we as a profession, I think, then succeed. Uh, it's painful to watch therapists who, who I know are good therapists, uh, and can offer good service, but they're struggling every week to, to you know, stream together a couple of clients. Um, and uh, so I guess that's why, you know, I hope, you know, they'll gain something from this and can, you know, start to build their referral networks and different things like that, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's amazing. Thanks for for uh, taking for all the sweat and all the work it took to do this. Yeah, yeah. no problem. So yes, and it's true. In a graduate program, there's barely any uh, any training, any training on how to start your practice, 
and a lot of people really feel very uh, scared by it. Mm -hmm. So I see many of my colleagues who, out of the fear of, they seem this as this huge mountain they have to overcome, mm -hmm. and they stay in their practice, in the practice that the the school gave them, which That's pay it. them yeah. a couple of dollars That's per it. hour, because even though they have all the training, That's they're it. so afraid of taking the step. That's where my exactly my journey started in the sense that I did uh, an internship um, here in Montreal and uh, they would pay me a small amount of money and they would charge the client far more uh, so I get a little cut of it um, and there were probably 20 therapists all working there in the same model and various years of experience, 20 years of experience getting paid you know a fraction of what they could be making um, I quickly grew frustrated with that experience um, and then worked at a deal with the, uh, the director of that clinic to uh, uh, use the room um, between the official clients. And uh, so I started charging the rate I wanted to charge, I thought it was more fair, mm. and uh, slowly built up my practice that way uh, until I was kind of you know, sufficiently uh, filled up that I could kind of start my own, you know, somewhere else. But I do think a lot of therapists don't recognize their value. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of settle for, again, a small amount of money, just because they're so scared that I'm not going to find any clients on my own. Like, I think that's a common kind of fear that runs through therapists. Um, so they just kind of settle for, again, as you said, like whatever fell into their laps when they left school. Mm -hmm. right? And I think about all the years that they're making far less than they could be making. Uh, or just have, you know, they just have a less uh, control over their, their careers. Yeah. You know? So I find that a kind of a sad idea. So. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you, so it seems that you saw a problem mm -hmm. and then instead of just talking about it, maybe complain about it, which it can be also useful, you did something about it. Yeah. Which I think is pretty good. Yeah, I enjoy writing um, and it was kind of like a, just a fun hobby uh, on the side, you know, if a client didn't show up or if I had a day off, I, you know, I would kind of just enjoy that process, really got into it. And because I had kept track of how I did it, it was actually a fairly easy book to write. Uh, mm -hmm. I just kind of flowed comfortably. Um, and it, you know, once you kind of finish a project that it kind of inspires you that, okay, I can actually do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what kind of you know, spurred me on to the, in terms of the next book ideas and, you know, these kind of things. So it was, it's been a really kind of a nice addition to my life as well. So again, I hope it benefits others, but it's also been positive for me. Mm, well, I'm glad. Mm -hmm. um, I remember a few years ago I was online. I think I didn't, I haven't started my masters yet, and there was this lady from uh, from the states saying how it was for health, her mental health professionals. They were the lowest paid of throughout the whole health system and how she really wanted to change that. So she had this problem to make people therapy successful. Mm -hmm. And I saw that and yeah, it really struck me. It's like, yeah, how come? And she was talking part of it, I guess it's also part of the health system. Part of it is this discomfort around money. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that for people, maybe your own fears or the fears you think you've seen in other colleagues, this fear of um, asking, like of getting paid, getting paid for doing something that's supposed to be supposed to be charitable. That's it. Uh, I, I mentioned that in the book, the idea that you know we have this kind of altruistic view of uh, ourselves, and there's some truth to that. We are, you know, I think as a group, a kind of caring, compassionate bunch of people. Um, you know, we want to help people, and we get satisfaction from that. So if there's value for us, we feel good about it. Um, so the idea of of trying to maximize how much you can make in that exchange. Uh, I think is uncomfortable and maybe off-putting for some therapists, um, which again leaves them trapped in those kind of low-paying type jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I was really uncomfortable all through the, um, the internship and um, into my practice. The idea of you know, waiting while someone's counting out the money or asking me how much it costs or you know, you'll get clients who say, oh God, that's expensive, uh, you know, can't you charge less or I'm just a student, can you do this? And so you get a lot of that. Um, which is uncomfortable and having to say, no, you know, I don't want to, you know, work with you or I want to get paid this or and get that basic idea of like, what am I worth? You know, um, from my perspective in terms of how I've approached it is, um, when I first started my practice, uh, I was making like, so like a low amount of money because I was in that internship. When I went to uh, my private practice, I basically looked at what other PhD level psychologists were charging and charged that rate. 
Um, and then uh, every three or four months, I was raising my rate by about $10 for new clients um, with the idea of I'm going to let the market decide what I'm worth, I guess. And uh, that's been a very good system. So I think I would encourage other therapists to consider uh, that idea. You know, from my perspective, the idea of ten dollars in either direction is not going to fundamentally change how many people come to you. Mm -hmm. um, but when, you know, for every session you're doing, if you're charging an extra ten dollars, it starts to add up. You know, especially if you do that a few times. Mm -hmm. um, so from my perspective, you know, uh, continue to raise it, and then uh, when I find that you know enough people stop coming to me, I'll either drop it or keep it at that rate. So mm -hmm. it's a, that strikes me as the most logical way of approaching it. I do talk in the book as well that um, there are other people who are going to be more comfortable, you know, having a sliding scale or, or these types of things or work with, you know, people who don't have much money and that's perfectly fine. I guess the point I try to make in the book is approach what you charge uh, conscientiously and make a decision based on who are you targeting, you know, which population you want to work with. Don't do it because you're uncomfortable asking for more money. Um, so that, that's, uh, you know, I think the main bit I'm trying to get across. Mm. So kind of you're like taking this Adam Smith capitalist, mm -hmm. capitalist approach of letting the indivisible mm -hmm. hand decide. Sure, yeah, let the market decide. Which works for most of the time. So this yeah. is, I think yeah. it's a really good, really yeah. logical advice. Yeah. yeah. I think it's just a good idea in general to come up with your internal rules in terms of, you know, what do I charge? You know, do I have a sliding scale? Um, am I willing to make exceptions? Um, one of the points I suggest is if you're uncomfortable, you know, say charging a lot of money or more money, um, maybe for most of your clients you charge a higher rate, but then maybe have uh, a few spots each week where you do either pro bono work or far reduced rates um, so that you can get some clients in there that, you know, can't normally see you. Um, mm -hmm. so that's, and that's kind of a nice balance or maybe you can like offer groups for free or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really doesn't matter. It really comes down to kind of individual choice. But uh, again, just that basic point of doing it conscientiously, yeah. uh, rather than just out of discomfort. Kind of having a meaning, having an intention yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. Not just being mm -hmm. stopped by the, by the, the yeah, the, uh, the awkward feelings and yeah. stuff. So, yes, mm. which is what we're helping them. Yep. Helping our clients yep. do it with, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, how, so how much do you follow your own advice? You'd say. In terms of when I do therapy. In terms of uh, the things you've... Or in terms of like here. doing a practice. Yeah. Um, at this point, well, I mean, all of this is advice I have followed because I, I tried all these things. Um, nothing in that book that I suggest that I didn't try. Um, some strategies work better than others. Um, and some kind of produce results. I would say um, the, probably the most important one uh, is asking for reviews or getting clients to, to rate you online. Um, that's been consistently the, the thing that new clients refer to when they uh, contact me as I've heard your reviews are really good or I've read this about you here um, and you know we live in a society now where you know everything can be rated you know and that's super important you know next to essentially word of mouth which is probably the next best mm -hmm. but, excuse me next best uh, way of getting clients um, yeah having them review you um, is great, and then obviously you know whatever you can do to get uh, higher in your Google rank, and I mentioned some strategies in there as well in terms of how to do that. So, so you'd say that reviewing has become more important than word of mouth now with in our digital age. The review will reach a wider audience. That would be the, what I would say. Um, I certainly get a number of clients who contact me and say, you know, a family member has told me about you or a doctor has told me about you or whatever. So that's very helpful as well. Mm -hmm. um, but when I think about, uh, yeah, reaching a number of clients, the, these review sites, these review sites at RateMD and these types of places show up on the top of the Google search results. So anyone looking for psychologists is going to get RateMD as one of their top choices. Um, and if you're near the top of that, well, you know, you're laughing. Yeah, you're more likely to yeah. someone's going to So I would say at this point in terms of like, you know, what do I still use? Um, at this point, my, the, the practice is running smoothly, so I don't have to do a whole lot anymore. Mm -hmm. I, still, um, I still have the reviews. Um, Psychology Today is probably one of your best starting places as well. 
uh, you go to psychologytoday.com and uh, sign up for uh, an account. Basically, about 40 bucks a month, you get a profile and you can kind of put your specialties and all this stuff. It's kind of a, a great resource for clients in terms of how to find a therapist. You have thousands of therapists they can search by all sorts of different criteria, different types of uh, disorders. Um, so that's a great resource. So that $40 expenditure, I think, is well worth it. Lots of clients, certainly at the beginning, were contacting me through there. Um, so you have to expect when you start your practice, you're going to have some, you know, outlay of money. Um, and, you know, I also talk about the idea of, you know, Google Ads is another possible option for people uh, mm -hmm. early on. All of, you know, it does have the possibility of spending a lot of money through that process. Um, so. Uh, you just have to expect you're going to be spending a couple hundred bucks uh, in order to run your practice. Yeah, when I was reading your book, have you read the forty hour, the four hour work week? By Ferris? No, I yes. haven't read it. I have read it. I haven't read it yet. I started. I almost finished it. I was yeah. listening to it on Audible, mm -hmm. but then by the end, I and it was also one of the um, impressions of one of my closest friends. I just at the end I just stopped. I was like, whoa, like this is so much. Like this four hour work week doesn't seem like four hours. It seems okay. like it took mm -hmm. months to get there. Okay. So for me it was just like I'm I'm gonna check some things, but mm -hmm. like it was overwhelming. Okay. Um I guess because I was familiar with that book when I read your book, there was a lot of really good tips. And actually I was going I didn't read it linearly, sure. I just went mm -hmm. chapter by chapter, mm -hmm. jumping back and mm -hmm. forth. And even though it seemed daunting, the many things were like, well, that's a lot of things to do. Mm -hmm. um, it was much more approachable. Okay, yes. I think it was much more approachable. It, the, the way it was written, it was super easy, super easy and just flowy. Yeah, yeah. It, to me, it was, it was not a chore. It was, it was kind of a delight to read it. It was really good. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, so I, it was a lot of Thank you. I, I, my writing style is very much no fluff, no extra stuff. I'm just going to say as many facts essentially in a row in a, in a kind of a fairly good writing style uh, as possible. Um, so that's why, again, calling it a brief guide, you know, lets me off the hook. And I don't feel bad that it's a shorter <laughs> book. So I can just say, look, here are a bunch of good facts, like, you know, and strategies. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm very kind of choosy with the words. and. I want to be really simple and you know approachable and so uh, yeah so it was definitely a conscious choice to write it in that way. Oh good. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess it one case study right here it worked. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So what would you say to people who read your book and feel they're already overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they read your book and there's also there's some overwhelming what would you what would you say to them? Um, there's no rush I guess with any of these things. I think my instinct would be to pick you know, one or two strategies, even like, like start with a few basic ones. Um, and, I, and I try to give you a bit of a timeline in the book in terms of what to maybe start to approach first. So base things would be uh, having a website. Uh, this is kind of your number one thing. People have to find you online. You know, you can't get away these days without having a, a website. Uh, I do have a section at the beginning where I talk about how uh, for people who are technologically, you know, um, anxious, uh, you can pay companies to to do this for you um, for 80 bucks a month or so they can monitor your social media accounts, they can create a website for you that's very professional and clients can contact you through that. Uh, like I said, you can pay for Google Ads. So you can you can offload a lot of this work if you want to kind of put a little bit of money into it. Mm -hmm. um, and with all these things, I mean, you can just go and, and you know, you know, this week, like, like you would tell a client if they, you know, haven't exercised in forever, how would you approach that? You wouldn't say, okay, this week you're going to, you know, go four times. You're going to be like, okay, we're going to go one time this week for 15 minutes, take it really, really simple. So, you know, I would approach it the same way, you know, this week, can you do a little bit of research in terms of companies that you can create a website? And I offer throughout the book, you know, different uh, URLs and things for companies that I, I suggest and like. Um, so, you know, can you sign up for our website this week? You know, next week, can you, you know, add some images? Like, so it's really kind of, again, a slow uh, approach. Um, and with time, you'll start to see results. So it's, um, you don't feel like, by, by no means do you have to kind of, you know, do all these things really quickly. There's, you know, mm -hmm. there's no rush, realistically. Um, so that's how I think I would approach it, is just, you know. You know tell them to take one day at a time, yeah. one step at a time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The way you would, kind of, like, what I'm hearing is, Use the skills you have with yeah. your clients with yeah. your own. Yeah. And even basic things like, you know, having a business card. 
And, you know, I mentioned in the book this internal rule of, you know, every time I say the word psychologist, I have to like hand it to, to people. And I'm uh, at banks and my real estate agent and, you know, doctor's offices. And like, I find ways to bring up my profession so that I can hand whoever a business card. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something anyone can do starting today. It's really quite, quite basic. Um, now, of course, all you have to get over is kind of the, you know, the discomfort of uh, being so uh, presumptuous or pro proactive in that. Proactive. Um, but, you know, again, one of the points I keep trying to make as well is, you know, that uh, the, the kind of shy therapist is going to have an empty calendar, that, that idea. So I do believe that to be true. Uh, you really do have to become comfortable at self-promotion. Uh, again, we're not saying that, you know, we're the best. We're just saying, hey, hey look, I think I have value that I can offer you. Uh, and I'm here if you are interested. And, mm -hmm. But you just need to keep hammering that point home to mm -hmm. as many people as you can. And with time, uh, you will find success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That part of being able to overcome that. Because um, when you, like the service, like the, the gifts we have, if we don't give them to everyone, anyone, mm -hmm. then what are the good things? Yeah. Good sense of that, yeah. right? Yeah. So here it doesn't, kind of what I'm hearing is, doesn't matter if we feel shy about it, if we, if we feel timid, mm -hmm. if we're doing that, we're doing a disservice yeah. to the world. Well, <laughs> okay, yes. Individual. Sure, yes. Yeah, the world is ourselves. diminished if we don't give out our cards enough, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, and what would you, what's, can you tell me a little bit about psychotherapy, how you see psychotherapy, the value of it? Mm -hmm. Um, so my particular therapeutic approach is cognitive behavior therapy and I combine um, dialectical behavior therapy as well because I work with a lot of borderline clients and people with high emotions so I use that as well. Um, in terms of, I do therapy a lot like how I wrote the book which is uh, very direct, uh, very honest, compassionate, um, I try to make it simple to understand. Um, and, uh, you know, often before the client, even if it's a new client, before they even sat down and taken off their coat, I'm already kind of in, in terms of, uh, the types of issues, uh, they need to work on. Um, one of the innovations or one of the things I do is I send a questionnaire to new clients and, um, it's like four pages long and I ask them a series of questions about their history and different problems they're dealing with and, and whatnot. And that's just been a great, um, tool for me in terms of not only reducing my anxiety in the initial session, but um, I'm really well then, really well prepared for that first session. They sit down, I know family history, I know about all the problems you're dealing with. Um, and so I, I, you can kind of come across as quite strong uh, mm -hmm. if you've, uh, you're starting in that way. Uh, lots of therapists, I think, uh, go into the session cold uh, and you have to spend a session or two uh, trying to, you know, learn about them. Uh, which for clients who, especially if they're paying a good amount of money, can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. uh, they just want to get their problem solved generally. Um, so I'm very um, quick to jump in to what I think are the main core issues. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm striving not to just focus on what are the, kind of the symptom level issues, but you know what are the underlying issues that are fueling those um, those you know, problems. Uh, so I will ask a lot of kind of. I strive to ask kind of penetrating questions. Uh, you know, what are the expectations the client has in these situations? What are the assumptions they're making? You know, if you can get at the underlying structure of their thinking. So if you were in a relationship, um, lots of people have kind of assumptions about how that relationship should go. So she should, um, you know, love me all the time, or she should do this and do this and do this. Now, what ends up happening then is that, you know, you've got this expectation for how the person should be, you have how the, the person is behaving, and then this, this discrepancy, this disparity, is what causes the grief. So, mm -hmm. looking at things like, if you, so once you start looking at the underlying assumptions of a problem, uh, we can start lowering our expectations, which then lowers the, the kind of the grief, the frustration, the anger. Um, so, I find that kind of a more kind of long-term effective approach, rather than, say, just focusing on anger management. You know, there, there, there's reasons, there's things fueling the anger, so let's get at Mm -hmm. at, at what those are. Um, so looking at the present state, the ideal step, and how to make it more realistic. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And, um, you know, I think in the other, kind of, you know, Roger talked about this, but the idea of kind of being non-judgmental uh, is absolutely critical. 
you'd be shocked in terms of, because one of the questions I asked in my questionnaire is, um, have you had therapy previously? And what was your experience like? You'd be kind of shocked to learn how many people are disappointed with the past therapy or have been traumatized by their past therapist. Um, it's kind of shocking to me when I, when I see that. And I'm actually generally surprised these days when I see someone who says, it was a great experience, I loved it, or it was very beneficial for me. Um, so I asked about that kind of thing early in the session, you know, in terms of what their previous experiences were, uh, because I'm trying to get at what are their, um, maybe their, their biases coming into therapy, you know. And so, so in addition to biases, again, the non-judgmental uh, approach uh, is going to put them at ease. Um, and that, that's something clients often mention is that uh, other therapists have been judgmental, especially around, you know, things like substance abuse and maybe uh, overeating and things like this that, that have like kind of a societal bias towards them. Um, you know, therapists are people and they kind of bring their own, you know, biases and schemas into, into therapy. But, um, you know, I think the most effective therapists are the ones who are able to uh, be aware of their own biases and then, you know, ideally get rid of them or mention them to clients, I guess, if, if they're happening in therapy. So that's typically how I, I approach. Um, and it, I guess the other thing I've learned as well, one of the things I learned, when I, especially when I was in uh, my internship or a little above, I would have like um, students working with me mm -hmm. and uh, they were often shocked how quickly I was, I was conducting therapy in terms of how fast we were moving to, you know, through different things or getting to core issues or whatever. One of the things they realize when I do that is that clients can tolerate quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Again, not, you know, obviously every client, but most clients can tolerate a faster pace of therapy than I think most therapists are aware of. Um, so I think, you know, I would often encourage therapists to kind of speed up their approach a little bit. Because uh, I think it's just valuable for, again, not every therapeutic modality is going to agree with that. The, the psychodynamic therapist is going to probably, you know, complain about that idea. But uh, from my perspective, I, I want the client in that as quickly as possible because I want them to get as many benefits as they can, get on with their lives, and then I get the next client to come in and help them as well. So, um, yeah, that, that whole approach of kind of approaching therapy fairly quickly has been helpful as well. Okay, so approaching it quickly, starting, like there, there's a version of the questionnaire in the book mm -hmm. that is uh, very useful. Mm -hmm. So you, you want them, you want to already know about them. I do, bit. yeah. So you can start and you see that, that as in your experience, client can um, can support much more pressure than we make. That's what I found. Yeah, yeah. It uh, yeah. It doesn't uh, doesn't always work. I think again, especially with certain types of clients, like my substance abusing clients, especially. Um, you know, there's that whole idea of like the stages of change, and you know, some people uh, maybe they're being pressured to be in therapy or they're whatever, uh, or they're younger or they're you know, and so. Part of my struggle, because I approach therapy quickly, is to learn to uh, figure out where that client is at. You know, so again, especially with some, you know the substance clients. You know, are they? You know, they may be talking about wanting to change, but are they at all in that? You know, that mindset. Because what often then happens is, you know, and I've learned this the hard way. Uh, when I sometimes approach clients too quickly uh, in that first session, uh, they get scared away and they they go away. Mm. Um, and that's you know. It, something I think all therapists have to deal with and you kind of try to learn from it and, and you know, uh, mm -hmm. not make those mistakes again. But it's, um, in general, I think most clients can tolerate it at a faster pace. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. And there, you said you're also speaking about sobriety and addiction. Mm -hmm. You were also writing another book. I am, yeah. So uh, it's called Finally Getting Sober. Uh, I do have a website, finallygettingsober.com that I'm, uh, that's out there right now where it has kind of some sample chapters that I have. Um, and I'm hoping the book will be ready uh, the first uh, half of 2019. Mm. Um, so it's going to be for clients uh, in terms of trying to quit any type of uh, either drug or alcohol. Um, and uh, it's kind of a similar style. It's, it's uh, you know, short little sections, you know, right to the point, you know, really, um, helpful strategies that I've worked with my clients now. Um, I used to work in addictions clinic and stuff, so I have kind of a lot of experience. I've done a lot of readings and workshops, so I've got a little, kind of a lot of experience in the area. Um, and I think it's gonna just, and the other thing is, there's just not many resources out there, you know, for substance abusing clients, which is kind of shocking, you know, when you think about the, you know, 10 to 13% of the population 
uh, would meet criteria for these things. Um, it's shocking that there aren't kind of uh, really good books for clients to, you know, how do I tackle this problem? Uh, you know, there's some books for therapists and stuff, but it's just, uh, you know, uh, for clients. And, yeah, and a lot of it, a lot of books that are out there are written by, you know, maybe former addicts themselves or people who don't have much training in the area or so it, um, it's actually a frustrating area of therapy in general. And, and I, I can broaden this complaint to even, uh, a lot of the, you know, clinics that are focused on, on substance abuse. They don't tend to hire people who have much training in the area. Um, so it's, um, Again, I think we do clients quite a disservice when we don't offer them, you know, uh, scientifically, you know, valid tools for, for helping themselves. So that's what kind of the, the, the impetus for that book has been, is to kind of fill a niche that I, I, I think desperately needs filling. Mm. So that's the, that's, the, that's the next one. That's the one I'm kind of halfway through now. Um, and the one after that will be like a, you know, a brief guide to doing therapy. So we're talking to, to four therapists in terms of how to kind of approach our profession. That's another book? That's, another, yeah, that's, that's, that's the okay. one. So. Is this your first book? That's my first one. Yeah. First book. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so the second one will be on sobriety. Mm -hmm. And that sounds great. I'm really looking forward to yeah. reading it. Yeah, I'm excited. The experience yeah. I've had and say there's not as many um, resources for clients. So this will be yeah. a good resource mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And then after that, you're thinking of one about therapy. About therapy. And simple. Yeah. I guess will it be similar format? It'll this? be almost exactly. I, I, I love that format. It's really easy to write and uh, it, it, it's, just kind of my, it's my natural style. Uh, okay. So it, uh, I think any book I write will be. <laughs> that's the blueprint. So. Nice. And I like your conclusion. In conclusion, there's all these tips yeah. that, that kind of. Could you, I guess you they couldn't fit them in. Them in. No, there was no so logical place for that. Yeah, so I just kind of threw a bunch in at the end. Which is great. Like the. I think Tim Ferriss talks about it, but I, because there was so much he talks about, mm. then I just disregard yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But this one on not opening your emails or your messages yeah. unless you're ready to That's it. Add them. That's it. The I started doing that. Yeah. And not just with professional yeah. messages, but also with friends' messages. Yeah. Like, yeah, it makes a lot of difference. It does. Um, there are, I see this in the book as well, there are a lot of uh, things we do as therapists. Uh, that eat up time that don't need to be, you know, don't need to be there. And you can automate a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And as you, uh, you know, so one of the points I try to make is, um, yes, you need to, or the, the tips will help you become more successful. But, you know, the, the key thing is then to be able to maintain that success, right? It's mm -hmm. not just about getting a certain number of clients or a certain rate. Uh, you need to maintain this over the long haul. And, you know, we waste a lot of time. So, you know, things you know, like getting your folders out in the morning or keeping track of who owes what or, you know, reminding clients or, you know, all these different things that we do that, you know, are a few minutes here and there, again, over months and years add up to, you know, hours and hours and hours of, you know, time that there's no value for you and can be frustrating. Um, so I talk about things like, you know, developing, you know, or uh, using therapy software uh, management uh, programs that can basically automate all of these tasks, um, you know, that kind of thing are super helpful. You know, mm -hmm. and make our job again less frustrating and allows us just to kind of focus on what we're, you know, what we love doing. Yeah. So hmm. less paper, like less have to be stressing about the, the red tape or yeah. the whole paper. Right? And the clients love it. I mean, you know, all of my clients, uh, in terms of my new clients, they just get a, an email to an online like portal system that's secure. Um, and they get my questionnaire through that. The questionnaire gets sent back through there. Um, they can see my calendar. They can request sessions. Um, they can pay through there if they want. Uh, it's all done just electronically and I'm constantly told by clients, this is a really great system. I love this. this is, I haven't seen this before, you know, so it's, uh, you know, again, when you're looking at differentiating yourself as a therapist, mm -hmm. if you've got a comfort with technology, that's one of the ways. So even like, you know, using, you know, Square as a payment system and like, you know, things like this, that you know, give clients kind of more ways to uh, interact with you or, or, or pay for your services. Mm -hmm. uh, makes you seem just even more competent uh, mm -hmm. and successful. So exactly, mm -hmm. and it helps them, helps you, yep. helps the whole yep. process. Mm -hmm. That that program you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, do you also play with the data? Like once they say, like I have, because um, I saw the questionnaire, there were open questions. Mm -hmm. So do you analyze the data somewhat, or do you just use it for your client? I don't. Um, 
I just use it for those particular sessions, but you could, I guess, if you want to start putting them into an Excel sheet or SPSS or something, you, you probably could. Um, I guess I don't care enough to like actually do like mm. uh, analysis of it. Of the um, Montreal yeah. area, I guess. Yeah. The I, angle I, effect, angle effect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, there's probably some value in that. Uh -huh. um, where that can become beneficial is, and I, I talked about this as well, is um, if you have clients um, fill out like outcome questionnaires, um, so uh, I was using one called the outcome questionnaire where uh, they would fill it out you know before the session and that would give me a sense for where they're at um, in terms of their depression their anxiety or whatever and then that program would you know send me the results instantaneously and it would compare them to a national sample and so that's very mm. helpful um, but you know once I left graduate school like you know in terms of statistics I stopped caring mm. so I'd rather yeah. someone else do it all for me I'm, I'm the same way yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, amazing. Is there something else you would like to, to talk about? Mm, I don't think so. Nothing come, comes to mind. Comes to, okay. I think you kind of covered the main things. Hmm. So there's a lot of good, really good nuggets of <laughs> gold here. Really good. So I, I really recommend it. And um, yeah, and I thank you for, for doing such a book, oh, not just using the information for yourself, but also using it, and also right. using it again, because I mean, you, you make a book, you make money out of it, and you help many others that's also, right. and that's right. that way you also help the broader society, so that's uh, well, I have a, I have amazing. A, thank you, I have, a, <laughs> I have an example of that, when, uh, when I was first starting out, I, I contacted a uh, successful colleague and asked if uh, I could meet with this person to you know help me get into the field and uh, this therapist said no I get these requests all the time it's kind of a trade secret I'm not gonna tell you how I have been so successful oh, and uh, I kind of never forgot that I was like oh that's such a selfish way of looking at things and uh, so I think you know the, the seed of this book I think probably started <laughs> with, uh, with with that uh, that I didn't uh, I didn't want to be one of those people that yeah. uh, just kind of holds it all you know there's a, there's enough people who need support out there that uh, we can kind of all be successful so it's not exactly that, that we don't need to kind of compete in that sense yeah yeah funny you say that because I also even when I first before I started my undergrad I contacted um, the, a friend the friend of a friend who was a, uh, a therapist a psychologist and she gave me a few minutes of her of her uh, time. Mm -hmm. She seemed really angry and passive aggressive. So yeah. was fine. I find it very weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so that's great. Yeah. Out of that, this beautiful thing came. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Eric. My pleasure. We'll put the links there for um for the book, his website, and also if you could rate if once you read the book, if you can rate him on Amazon. That's that'd be great for a platform, yes. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you can rate the book on Amazon, it will be great. You can get over there. So thank you so much, guys. If you have any questions, please let us know in the comments below, or also you can contact me or Eric directly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my dear friends. Thank you so much for watching this video. We really hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know in the comment section below, and make sure to like this video, share it if you think anyone can benefit from it, and subscribe to our channel if you haven't so we can keep you updated on more awesome videos on yoga, mindfulness, spirituality, psychology, etc. Thank you so much.